What is a pirate's favorite litter? Close the sea. Uh, second joke. Uh, these aren't mine. I can't take credit for them. Um, second joke is what is a pirate's favorite kind of movie? Yes, you got it. Arr. <laughs> My name is Adrian Buckley. I'm going to talk to you about a, uh, an open source ethical design science uh, called permaculture. Um, permaculture is a um, it's, it's a design science geared towards creating a sustainable human habitat uh, in all of its forms, and it's guided by ethical principles. So let's just dive in here. Um, is this human habitat? No. No. This these kinds of habitats are always going to consume more than they'll ever give back. Um, and so this is a, this is a lawn. Uh, this lawn is requiring all sorts of um, goodies, um, synthetic fertilizers, uh, in industrial insecticides. Each time these materials are applied to this landscape, um, the soil food web, that web of life underneath, um, uh, perishes, and it is that web of life that um, that supports that supports our life. Our health is completely correlated. To the health of this web. So, what are we going to do about the, what, what are we going to do about these things? Um, we're surrounded. We're utterly surrounded by problems in this world. Um, our wells, our drinking water is getting contaminated with uh, toxic levels of the matrix as we speak. Um, there is nuclear war. There's all these this, these this hierarchy of problems. Um, and me. Entering a new career a couple of years ago, I found this more and more and more disempowering because I felt there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. And so you, I was hearing reports from the IPCC on how many degrees the Earth is warming up on, uh, is, is warming up, um, from a whole variety of social and environmental groups about the all the the effed up things happening in this world and so and it just it's 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 no wonder there's there such a high rate of depression in, in developed countries um so i've become more and more and more disempowered um and so until by accident i have um started to i've, I've accidentally found a community of um of people working on different things drawn from natural systems so let's explore this a little bit further um, actually, before we do, I just want to say this: so many problems are caused. So many, so many problems are caused by our, our current settlement patterns. Um, that lawn I showed you um, represents one of the, I'll say this sarcastic, one of the best business models on the planet. The more we spray pesticides and herbicides on these landscapes, the more they depend on them, because we we've, we've put these landscapes on intravenous. They, they require human input. And so it's, it's, it's a system that cannot take care of itself and, and, and it just does nothing but create problems. But then we get into design science. And design science focuses on how different things connect. Um, and actually, let me fast forward because I have a little photograph to show you here. I'm going to go to this photo right here. Let me start with this. Uh, here you see a forest. You see an intact ecology. And my question for you is, is, when is the last time that you had to see little garden gnomes come out in the middle of the night to water it? <laughs> or to come out in the middle of the night and provide insect control or fertilizer? <laughs> um, so the answer is probably no. I, I know I haven't. I've been looking for a long time. Um, <laughs> so these systems, in some, they're geared towards taking care of themselves. So all the little coyotes, the rabbits, the sugar maples, uh, and the arthropods in the system are in the habitat. They, all the things that they need are found in the system. And the very fact that they're living in, in that system guarantees that other, other things in the system can also find what they, what they need. And so this, in this situation can be found a lot of the problems that we can apply, apply proactively uh, towards making this world a better place, and so what are these? What are these? Uh, these these things that we can draw on? Um, well, there's a couple of strategies that we can do right away, and everything that I'm going to talk about from this slide on, we can do for the price of a shovel. Um, we don't need any specialized kind of training, degrees, um, luck, um, or 
any other kind of um, any other kind of um, unique situation. This this, this is what what. What I'm about to talk about are things that we can all do. Uh, I'll do uh, starting tomorrow. So this is a first a strategy that we can draw for the way natural systems work all over the world. Uh, and that is that they inherently capture and store energy. So here you can see two different landscapes. One is, is a deforested watershed um, or a hillside. The next is the same, the same system, but some designer went in and revegetated it and set up a whole lot of different storages for water. Um, this kind of landscape, when each time it rains, is going to start losing all of its fertility, all of the very ingredients for life. Um, all those ingredients for life are going to flow down into the ocean. In this system, like healthy forests, resources and water and energy is being captured. And then it's, once it's being captured, it's being slowed down slow enough for organisms to use it. So this is what goes on in natural systems. Here's an example. Nutrients. Um, there's all sorts of diseases um, on the rise these days. And they're actually not rising linearly. They're rising exponentially. All these mineral deficiency diseases are threatening um, us all over the world. And so, and the, one of the reasons uh, why they're coming up is because there's no more nutrients in our food. Because again, we've, we've killed that, that soil food web. Um, here's, an, here's an example taken from nature to do with nutrients. You see all this greenery happening here. This is a deciduous forest. Um, and underneath these trees, we can see these spring ephemeral bulbs coming up. And so, these spring ephemeral bulbs have adopted this, this ingenious repairing strategy of capturing and storing energy. So what's, what the big picture of what's happening here is you have a deciduous forest that just lost all of its snow melt. And all the goodies that we need for our health, all the goodies that the plants and the animals need for their health, becomes water soluble. And so these plants, as soon as the snow melts, these guys spring right into action. Uh, and they suck up all those waterborne nutrients or ingredients for life. And so now the snow melts, all the nutrients are stored in the bulbs, as well as the leaves in these little plants. And then when the leaves of the trees come into, in, come into spring, all these little bulbs then go dormant for the year and they pass all, the, all those nutrients back into the system. So then the plants and the animals can have access to them. It's an ingenious strategy that's 3.2 billion years old. Uh, ecology is, I always like to say, is one of the best engineers on the planet because it has all these years of experience on its resume. And so all we have to do is look to these systems for inspiration of how we can start redesigning our human habitats. Water storage. Water is the, water is life. This is a photograph I took by my parents' place uh, from Nova Scotia. And uh, this is a, um, a, a gravel roadway, and I'm standing here looking up a very gentle hill. And here's a driveway, and just out of the focus of the camera are a number of larch trees. Those are the kind of, um, they're essentially spruce trees that lose their needles every, every fall. Uh, the, the deciduous spruce trees. And so, in this part of the world, um, just to put this into context, we get these big storms called nor'easters, and so they blow all the needles off, and then um, with heavy rain, all these needles flow down this driveway and down the side of the road. So most roads are built with a crown, so the, uh, the edges of the, of the road are lower in altitude than the middle, so all the water is fo focusing on the edge. Um, so what's happening is there's a whole needle-laden uh, waft of water starts rushing down this road, and the needles get so heavy that they start forming this little dam, this little uh, berm on contour line. It's, it's perfectly flat all along its length. Um, and so what, ha what, what happens, you can see this interesting harmonic. It's almost like, like a mechanical machine laid these needles, but no mechanical machine here. This is actually nature at work. Um, these needles form this little dam, the water backs up behind them, and then it flows passively over the dam and forms another one, then another one, then another one. You can walk on any woodland, um, gentle slope woodland road, and you'll, you'll, you'll see this happening or in driveways. But the reason why I'm talking about this the reason why I'm bringing this up is because 
this year, this is a couple years ago since I took this photo, this year, this is where I'm starting to see what we like to call weeds growing up, <laughs> and new trees. And so each of these little burns represent an upward spiral, so, which is the, the, the arc opposite to the all too familiar downward spiral. And so these spirals work in both ways, because as these little plants begin to grow, they're creating the right conditions to capture even more water and nutrients off this road, preventing it from running away. And so it, this prescription of net repair begins to set up until the uh, municipality plows it all uh, back down again. This, this road is just trying to be, return to a healthy system. So now we can look to this example as well, in terms of rehydrating our now dehydrated landscapes all over the world. This, this observation has led to people's careers around the world repairing deserts, which is the quickly, the fastest growing landscape on the planet right now. These deserts are being reversed as we speak right now. Where did I put that pointer? There it is. All right. Um, solar, energy, solar energy storage. This forest you're seeing is basically a big engine which is taking solar energy and then reinvesting it into this multitude of life just below the soil. That becomes the the very response for creating life uh, in, in the system. All the energy is not wasted, it's stored and changed into different forms. Um, so this is what, what ecology does, it captures and stores energy, and it makes sure that energy is available for all the things living in it. Our communities, our settlements right now, shed energy. Strategy number two, a second observation on how these natural systems work. Uh, and that's about integration rather than segregation. More and more and more our schools are teaching us to look at the parts and not the whole. So what this is all about is being a generalist, is, is looking at those connections between things. Because it doesn't, the, 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 the specific things just don't matter. It's the connections that we start seeing between them. It's the, those functional connections between living and non-living things that make this world go around. So we have to look at those and then start also using that as an inspiration for how we build our cities, our towns, and our properties and our community spaces. How do we do this? Well, we can look at, at a common element, like, like this fellow over here, a chicken. Uh, every living and non-living thing has intrinsic needs. They need things in order to continue being happy chickens. Uh, dust, air, shelter, grit, control, protection are all need, needs for a chicken. Um, but they're the funniest things to watch. Oh, I love chickens for that reason. <laughs> um, they produce heat, eggs, gas, feathers can be used for insulation, manure, which is one of the best soil builders on the planet. They make more chickens, and so on. So, I can bring in, I can consider another element, let's say in my community, um, and so another element could be a, a, a greenhouse. And so a greenhouse also inherently needs things, it needs space, it needs solar access, it needs heat inputs. Which, which chickens happen to provide. So if we start looking at a partnership between a greenhouse and a chicken, we might start finding ourselves more closer to a situation where one element can actually start fulfilling the needs of another element, and vice versa. And then we can bring in the next five, the next 10 elements, and use our, 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 uh, our ancient ability of pattern recognition and creativity to start bringing these elements functionally and meaningfully together. And this is what defines community. Community is those real and tangible and mutual and meaningful two-way relationships, three-way relationships and so on between people. And so um, this, is, this is the inspiration, this is the, the, the route that we need to go to start addressing these pressing problems in the world. Um, here's an example of integration and design. This is an aquaponic system which was uh, raised earlier uh, this evening, which is a brilliant application of integration and design. Here we have a fish system. Fish generate a whole, a whole lot of poo. Um, that poo is not a, um, that poo is not dirt. It's not a it's not a waste stream. It's actually a valuable resource. Um, the the poo laden water is brought at regular in intervals into a growing medium, growing veggies. And so bacteria in this in this vegetable garden hang out, and then they change uh, bacteria from one form to another that the plants then can use. So then all this nutrient becomes plant food. These, these plants can be fed back to these vegetarian fish, and the cycle is complete. And it's, it's the fish, that, the fish don't matter, 
The veggies don't matter, it's the connection between them that matters. That's why this system works. Can you say that one more time? It's the it's the, the fish, it's not necessarily the fish system that matters, it's not necessarily the vegetable garden that matters, it's this thing. It's the connection, it's the connection between them. It's that, that is what matters, that's why this system works. This is why this is what's called a self-regulating system. The system doesn't require human inputs. So, in this particular case, we, have, we could have a solar-powered pump, it's the, only, it's the only element we need uh, to make this move. In the natural world, we don't need solar-powered pumps. It's all happening without human intervention. This is a, an apple tree, um, a plant called comfrey, which has a really deep root and it goes and brings up all of the soil nutrients that will lost the rain. And so, um, when this plant defoilates, the apple tree is like, mmm, yum, I'm getting everything I need uh, just because of this plant being underneath me. And in exchange, I'll give you the, the ideal habitat for growing, dappled sunlight. Strategy number three, everything has a function. Everything has value. Even mosquitoes have value. I would wager to guess that if mosquitoes were lost uh, from a society today, we, we would eventually crumble. Um, because mosquitoes are one member in, the, in, the, in this large, intricate web of life. They have, and it's not even about that. It's just they have value. They're a living creature. So everything has a function. Everything has a value that's useful for something else, not necessarily us. Here, this creative designer, whoever he is, um, got this photo off of the internet. And he decided to take old repurposed rain gutters, perhaps they were lying on their way to, um, to the landfill, and he saw, well, there's another function in these just besides uh, transporting water. They make the perfect conditions for vertical growing space for greens on this shady northeast wall. So everything has a function. So if we can, the biggest yield, the biggest barrier, sorry, to yield uh, and to into design is our own imaginations. And so by applying functions, seeing the multitude of functions in common elements, we can really, really, really come up with these, these wonderful ideas and put waste with streams uh, to, to resources. There's no such thing as waste. Waste is only in, waste is, is only in um, human nature, not in nature. So here's an example. Here, imagine a kitchen vegetable garden. So what, does, what do vegetable gardens need? Well, of course, they, they need water. They need soil fertility, pest control, weed control, and so on. Um, so here's how in everyday, in the everyday mindset, how those things might be addressed. Well, we bring in municipal irrigation systems. We take in water from somewhere else, from some limited supply, sprinkler systems. How do we address this? Well, let's bring in some synthetic fertilizers. So mechanical aerating and so on, pest control, we bring in sides. What, what else is a side? Suicide. Um, <laughs> so we, these, these, um, this, this is a, this is a karate approach to, um, this is a karate approach um, to solving these problems. It's, it's over, overcoming a force with another force. Here, this is the Tai Chi approach. This is harmonizing with the, uh, with, with the, uh, the problem, changing the problem into a solution. We'll build mulch, we'll take other people's weeds. Um, we'll, build, we'll build soil, we're capturing stormwater, to, to, uh, taking the city's stormwater problem and changing it to an irrigation solution. Um, gray water recovery. How are we gonna build soil fertility? There's all sorts of plants that will do that for us. Uh, actually, I think there's a laser pointer on it. Yeah. Um, using perennial plants, which are really, really good at storing nutrients using polyculture, it's what a polyculture means is a whole lot of plants that work really well together. It's that integration and design was, I was speaking about earlier. The three sisters, corns, beans, and squash, work so well to, together because each provides something else that, that the other plant needs. The corn is a living trellis for the bean, um, creating habitat for predators, and so on. So we can, we can look at the system, we can work with nature rather than against it to address every single need the system we're dealing with um, has. Permabits. So this is this is the last thing I want to talk about is all of the great things happening in the city today. Um, community members are coming together to learn how to harvest and capture stormwater, rainwater. They're learning how soil building systems are being installed, all for the price of the shovel. They're learning about water harvesting earthworks. Let me go back to that slide. I'll put it on the computer, there we are, oops. 
Um, a permablitz is a day-long event where the community comes together to install the garden uh, for a host. And so for every two permablitzes people help out in, they're eligible then to have a crew come to their house uh, to put in a, a permaculture design. And so here's another example. Here's a, a steep slope uh, permablitz. Here's the, the previous site. And um, the um, we go to this slide, uh, the day later, this beginnings of what's going to be a, an edible forest gardens in place. Um, here's another project in town, in the north southwest of Calgary, Blank Lawn. Um, a pergola was built out of reclaimed wood, these herb spirals, all sorts of habitat in one small little place. Um, here's the finished garden ready for planting in the spring. All food, all done by the community. Here's another example. Perma blitzed out in the rain, 30 people came and learned about permaculture. <laughs> and now half the people have had a blitz of their own. <coughs> All these insect pollinator tractors that manage pests in the garden, there's no such thing as a pest problem. Here's another project. It's a good friend of mine's house. Three year old edible forest garden, all built by the community. That's the talk, that's permaculture. <laughs> Thank you.